And you have a great subject tonight. Good. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad everyone loves it. And yeah. I definitely, definitely want to hear feedback from people about, um, about the subject, what else they would like to hear about. Um, and I'll send around a survey to everyone who's registered uh, with the recording of the program. So tonight we are really excited to yeah. welcome Sue Scott. So I can hear them here. Oh, I also forgot to mention that everyone should mute themselves um, until they're asked to unmute themselves to ask any questions. Okay. How do I know if I've muted myself? I will go ahead and mute you and then I'll unmute myself again. So tonight we welcome Sue Scott. Sue Scott is a retired public librarian who lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's a longtime member of the Jane Austen Society of North America, that's JANSA, J-A-S-N-A, and frequently presents programs on topics directly related to Austen's novels. She was a speaker at JANSA's 2019 Annual General Conference, where her topic was the, brothels, the Brothers of North Anger Abbey, the good, the bad, and the ridiculous. She has also conducted classes on Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion for North Carolina State's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, OLLI. Now that she is retired, Sue finds much to her delight that she has more time to watch movies, drink tea, peruse farmer's markets, and of course, talk about all things Jane Austen. And so tonight, as a companion program to our online classics reading book group, um, Chelmsford Classics Book Group on Goodreads. Jay, Sue is online with us to present Pride, Prejudice, and Peculiarities, the Writing Quirks of Jane Austen. Have you been told that Jane Austen never wrote a scene without women in it? Have you noticed that some important characters in her novels don't actually say anything? What can you tell about an Austen character based on their first name? Austen's writing style has a number of unusual features and our speaker We'll discuss some of them in relation to Austin's most well-known novel, Pride and Prejudice. And so Sue has built in a couple of question breaks. If you have any questions during the program or during the presentation, please submit them to the chat um, or wait until the question break to unmute yourself and ask your question. So with that, I will turn it over to Sue. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jess. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, you and Jess, Deanna, Chelmsford Public Library for inviting me here to talk about my favorite subject, Jane Austen, specifically Jane Austen's writing habits or quirks as seen in Pride and Prejudice. Before I get started, I have been asked to um, talk about my background picture there. Uh, this is Troughton House in Southern England. Uh, this estate was owned by Jane Austen's brother, Edward. He was the rich brother. Um, when Jane Austen's father died, she and her mother and her sister, Cassandra, sort of kicked around Southern England for a few years until Edward offered them a place to live. Uh, not here in this big house, he offered them a cottage on the estate which they were very happy to have. They were very happy living there for the rest of their lives. And this is where Jane Austen was finally able to settle down and concentrate on her writing. This is where she revised her early novels, Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, and Northanger Abbey, and where she wrote from scratch what we generally call the mature novels, uh, Mansfield Park, Emma, and Persuasion. Okay. So I wanna get started now. Um, first thing I wanna talk about is this sort of myth of Jane Austen that I've heard a few times over the years is still around um, where I used to be told that Jane Austen never wrote a scene that didn't have a woman in it because she didn't know what men talked about while when they were alone, when there was no woman there. And this made sense to me because I knew that Jane Austen was very concerned with realism. She wanted to write about real people in real places, doing real things. 
And this was quite a departure from her fellow novelists of that time period. We're talking the, the late 1700s, early 1800s, right at the beginning of the novel as an art form. Most authors, actually pretty much all of them, their, their heroines were faultless. They were consummately lovely. They were um, always uh, virtuous, very virtuous. Uh, the, hit, the villains were completely evil. There was no gray areas in any of this. And often these novels would be kind of action packed with the villains would often abduct the heroine and take her away somewhere and try to force her to marry him. And she would have to defend her virtue over and over again in between fainting. There was a lot of fainting going on in these books. Um, some novelists were not quite that, um, what we would call rather silly today. Uh, people like Fanny Burney and Mariah Edgeworth wrote novels that were more like, uh, like comedies of manners, more closer to what Jane Austen would write. But even they had those heroines who were, uh, you know, face of an angel, sweet tempered, always virtuous, um, not much of a sense of humor. Uh, they were Jane Bennett, really. If any other author were writing the story of Pride and Prejudice, they would have made Jane the heroine and Elizabeth would have been her saucy sidekick. So when you are told that Jane Austen never wrote a scene without a woman in it for uh, real realism reasons, you, you tend to accept it, but it's not quite true. It's almost true. Uh, in all the six completed novels of Jane Austen, there are only four scenes that do not have a woman present. Three of those scenes are in Mansfield Park. One is in Pride and Prejudice. And I'm gonna show you that scene now, I hope. Let's see. Okay, this is the morning um, of the day that Bingley finally proposes to Jane. He and Mr. Bennett have agreed to meet that morning to go shooting together. And we are told Bingley was punctual to his appointment and he and Mr. Bennett spent the morning together as had been agreed on. The latter was much more agreeable than his companion expected. There was nothing of presumption or folly in Bingley that could provoke his ridicule or disgust him into silence. And he was more communicative and less eccentric than the other had ever seen him. And that's it. Um, that is a scene without women. And it's, it hardly counts really because we, we don't know what they talked about. We certainly don't see the words they used, but it's there. It's a scene with just a couple of guys out doing manly things and having some conversation at the same time. Now the ones in uh, Mansfield Park, uh, of those three scenes without women, one of them is like that one uh, with no direct speech in it. The other two are conversations, both of them between uh, Sir Thomas Bertram and Edmund. Um, both discussing uh, Fanny Price. Um, Mansfield Park is full of discussions about Fanny Price, the heroine, when she is not in the room. So that is that done with. Now that we've got that cleared up, let's move on to a couple of things that Jane Austen did completely differently from any authors of the time. One is that she didn't tell us much about what her heroines and heroes looked like. Uh, other authors would, they would tell you in great detail all about how beautiful a face of an angel, consummately lovely their heroines were. Um, but Jane Austen seemed to prefer, especially in Pride and Prejudice, she seemed to prefer that we see Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy through the eyes of other characters 
the narrator, that objective narrator, doesn't really get involved very much in this. It's what other people say that give us any clues about what they look like. Uh, so of course we know that even though Mr. Darcy originally thinks that Elizabeth Bennet is only tolerable, he comes to feel that she has fine dark eyes and a figure that is light and pleasing. Uh, we know that Elizabeth is probably not very tall because Lydia claims to be the tallest of the daughters. Mr. Bingley says that Elizabeth Bennet is very pretty when he recommends her to Mr. Darcy as a dance partner. And the neighborhood, the people in the neighborhood do believe that the Bennet sisters, except of course for poor Mary, that the Bennet sisters are all beauties although Jane is the most beautiful. But Miss Bingley would disagree. She does disagree uh, about Elizabeth Bennet. She doesn't understand how Elizabeth Bennet is said to be such a beauty. Miss Bingley thinks that she doesn't have any features that are handsome, that her nose wants character, her face is too thin, her complexion has no brilliancy, her teeth are tolerable, but nothing out of the ordinary. That's the most detailed description we get of Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice, but of course, we can't really trust it. We have to consider the source. We know even less about what Mr. Darcy looks like. He seems to be generally agreed to be tall and well-built. Uh, when he comes into the Meriton Assembly at the beginning of the book, and um, it's known that he has 10,000 pounds a year, it is agreed among the people there that he is a very handsome man. But by the end of the evening, he has been so rude to people that they decide maybe he's not very handsome after all. We do know how old these people are. We know that Elizabeth Bennet is 20 and that Mr. Darcy is 28. It is important to readers to know the ages of people, isn't it? Because the knowing the age helps to shape your view of what they might look like, uh, how they think, how they might act. Uh, but in novels of the period, um, we are generally only told the heroine's age. You'll always be told how old the heroine is in the first chapter. She's always young. Uh, the author wants to make it clear that she is very marriageable. And so uh, we are always told that. But it is rare to be told the age of anyone else in the novel. But of course, Jane Austen didn't do it that way. Of course, she did the opposite. She told us lots of ages, um, especially in Pride and Prejudice. Um, we know at the very beginning that of the Bennett daughters, uh, Jane is 22, Elizabeth is 20, Catherine or Kitty is 17, and Lydia is 15. Poor Mary. Uh, we are not told her exact age. We know, though, that she is the middle daughter, and so we know that she is either 18 or 19. We are not told how old Mrs. Bennett is, but we are given enough information to be able to make a good guess. We are told that she's been married for 23 years. And uh, we know, uh, and Jane Austen's first readers would have known that most women at the time were married between the ages of 18 and 24. We suspect that Mrs. Bennett is no exception since we are told later on that Mr. Bennett married her because of her beauty and her vivacity, uh, not stopping to check to see how silly she is. Uh, and so that's how he wound up with such a silly wife. So doing the math, we can figure out that Mrs. Bennett is probably in her early 40s. If you watch the film adaptations, as I do, you might be surprised to hear that uh, because for whatever reason, the film adaptations always have actresses playing Mrs. Bennett who are in their late 40s or early 50s. So we tend to think of her as being older than she really is. Um, Mr. Collins has the same problem. 
in the film adaptations, he's usually played by an actor who is in his late 30s or early 40s. But we are told in the book that Mr. Collins is only 25 years old. He acts a lot older than that, but he is really a, still a very young man of 25. Uh, this makes Mr. Collins, it gives him the distinction of being the only man in Jane Austen's novels who marries a woman who is older than he is. Because we are told that Charlotte Lucas is about 27. 27 is a very interesting age um, in Austen's novels. And Eliot, the heroine of Persuasion is also 27. She has lost her bloom and her father fears that she will not be able to find anyone to marry her of her own high social status. In Sense and Sensibility, at the beginning of the book, um, Mary Ann believes that a woman of seven and 20 can never feel or um, attract affection again. Um, Marianne is quite a character, isn't she? She, but the most important thing or the most interesting thing about the age of 27 is that Jane Austen herself is, was 27, about 27 is how old she was, days away from becoming 27 when she received her, her only marriage proposal that we know of um, from a young man who lived nearby, who was set to inherit a large estate whose three sisters were good friends with Jane and her, her sister, Cassandra. He proposed to her one night, she accepted immediately, but then the next morning she took back her acceptance. The other 20, almost, the other character who might be 27 is Anne de Berg. We are told that she was born the same year as Mr. Darcy, who is 28, or a little later. So she's either 27 or 28. I like to think she's 27. Um, excuse me a minute, I have dropped some of my notes. Hmm. Okay. I wanna get all these ages Right. That's odd. And embarrassing. Okay. I'll just see what I can remember. Uh, yes, Anderberg, 27, 28. Georgiana Darcy is 16. Mr. Bingley is 22. And we are not told that exactly, but we are told that he has been of age less than two years before he comes to Netherfield. Uh, and back then you came of age at the age of 21. You became a legal adult at 21. So less than two years, he's 22 years old. Colonel Forster, Colonel Forster, Colonel Fitzwilliam is uh, about 30. We're told a lot of ages. Georgiana, did I say, is 16. Uh, uh, Mrs. Gardner is, we're told, younger than Mrs. Bennett and her sister, Mrs. Phillips, several years younger. So depending on how you define several, she is somewhere in her 30s. We even know that of the four Gardner children, the oldest two are girls. They are ages six and eight, and their brothers, their two brothers are younger than they are a lot of ages. Jane Austen did the opposite of everybody else when it came to giving you um, a description of the main characters. The others gave you a lot of details. Jane Austen does not. Other people, other authors rarely tell you the age of anyone but the heroine. Jane Austen tells you lots of ages. He is not like any of the others in lots of ways. So um, here I've reached the halftime mark of my talk. 
uh, let's stop and see if there are any questions or comments. Well, speaking of uh, Jane, your uh, observation about Jane Austen and keeping track of the ages of all of her characters, um, I think I may have read in the preface uh, to Pride and Prejudice uh, mm -hmm. that it's thought that she plotted out the calendar during which that novel takes place and that some scholars have tried to recreate the exact days on which things happen. Occasionally, she mentions a day of the week, for instance, or a holiday. Mm -hmm. And so you have certain points you can tie down. And it seems to me, if that's true, that that characteristic ties right in with her desire to have everybody's age precisely plotted. I think you're right. She um, scholars have tried to do that. They haven't quite managed it. Nothing. They can't find a year that seems reasonable that fits right in. But they can get close. And other of her books, sometimes they can. They have. They can find it exactly. But um, you're right. Although what's odd is that her book *Pride and Prejudice* takes place over most of a year, but no one ever seems to celebrate a birthday. It's never mentioned, but people do turn a year older um, over the course of that book. I think that Lydia is 15. We're told she's 15 at the beginning, but I believe she's 16. It's mentioned that she's 16 at the end. So people do get older. Um, but yes, that uh, attempt by scholars certainly uh, has been made. And you can find timelines where it's worked out as closely as they can, for sure. Good question. Anyone else? Um, Mena. Oh, Jess, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, Nadia um, asks, uh, was it common for girls as young as Lydia to get married? Oh boy, I'm not sure if it was common. Certainly, um, when you were that young, I think you had to have your parents' permission. Uh, that's one of the reasons people ran off to Scotland, because you didn't have to have a parents' permission to get married there if you were young. So uh, that's why uh, Lydia was heading, heading that way, or she thought she was heading that way with Mr. Wickham, but um, he wasn't taking her to there. there. Uh, but if it was common, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if it was common at that time. I mean, it still happens now. But um, in North Carolina, they're, they're trying to get a law passed saying that you have to be, you can't get married at the age of 14 or 15, which you can do here now, we are ashamed to say. But um, certainly in England at the time, that wouldn't have been considered incredibly young to get married, but you would need a parent's permission to do that. Mm -hmm. And then um, Laura Bearfield asks uh, how she's interested in how exactly are you tying Austin's age of 27 to her proposal to the age of Jane's friend, uh, Charlotte Lucas? Oh, just noting that they are the same age. And that's, that's interesting. I, I think it's interesting that Jane Austen keeps using that age 27. She could choose anything, but she keeps choosing 27, which just happened to be the age she was about to turn at that real pivoting point in her life that was so important. Uh, if she had stuck with her yes to Harris being with her, it, it would have changed her life immeasurably. We probably wouldn't have had all these novels if that had happened. She had gotten married and started having children and not have time to write. It so often happened, yeah. Um, just, um, if Linda I... has her hand raised. Go ahead, Linda. Oh, Linda. So until you actually mentioned their ages um, tonight, I hadn't realized that there was a seven year age difference between Lizzie and Charlotte. Would that mean Lizzie was actually closer in age to the younger, Charlotte's younger sister? Mar is her name Mariah? I am. Um, we don't know how old Mariah is. She certainly seems awfully young, doesn't yeah. she? But, but it seemed like maybe she and Charlotte were closer because they just had more in common than Elizabeth felt with Mariah. But um, 
now that I'm thinking about it, maybe Mariah was even closer in age to Lizzie than Charlotte was. Hard to say. I bet she was. I mean, now that we think about it, mm -hmm. she probably was. Uh, she was probably the next girl in line mm -hmm. to the family to come out. So she went on that trip with them to, to Rosings. Yeah, she was the one chosen for that trip over the other um, other daughters in the family. Um, so yeah, I, I think you're right, but I can't see Elizabeth and Mariah being good Perfect. friends. No. No, no, the, Mariah doesn't have enough sense. Right. Not like Charlotte Lucas, no. But good point, oh, I like that. Hmm. And I think that's everything we've got so far. Um, so we'll just wait for the next next break to um, to ask more questions. Okay. At this point, oh, I, what I want to do right now is uh, recommend to you a couple of books if you are interested in these things that I'm saying and that I will say. Uh, there are a couple of books that I leaned on really heavily for this talk. Um, and one of them is called What Matters in Jane Austen hmm, by John Mullen. Uh, this is my favorite book about Jane Austen. I love it. The other one is Jane Austen and Names by Maggie Lane. And Deanna is putting this in these titles in the chat for you right now. So you don't have to worry about how's that spelled and so on. Just uh, check the chat and Deanna will, uh, will be your friend there. Okay, there she is. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about idiolects. That's I-D-I-O-L-E-C-T. An idiolect is the way a particular person talks. We all have an idiolect. We all have our own vocabulary. When we're talking, we have our favorite words, our favorite expressions that we use. Sometimes some people talk really quickly, other people are more considered in what they say. That's our idiolect or our voice. Um, and Jane Austen was really good at this. Um, she developed a different idiolect for each of her characters. She wasn't the first one to do it, but certainly um, dialogue was a specialty of hers. Uh, just read that first chapter of Pride and Prejudice, which is almost all dialogue. It's fantastic, it's masterful. But even so, she developed a technique that was almost the opposite of that, where she, um, for certain characters, she denies them any quoted speech. There are characters who talk and talk and talk, and yet we are never given their actual words. We're just told that they're talking or what they're talking about or not even that. For instance, uh, Georgiana Darcy. We're told that she's a very shy girl, um, often silent. She tries to talk more when her brother is around because she wants to please him. Uh, at one point, we're told that she does venture a short sentence when there was least danger of its being heard. But we don't know what that short sentence was. We never see any of these actual attempts at talking. Uh, she is completely wordless in the novel. Uh, and Jane Austen seems to do this just to emphasize her shyness. Anne de Berg is another person who is never given uh, any direct speech in the novel. For her, it's probably because she never says anything worth reporting. Like the narrator just says, oh, there's nothing going on here, nothing of interest. Um, we just won't bother with that. Um, as John Mullen says in the book I just told you about, she is of course the stooge to her endlessly talking, endlessly commanding mother. And we can feel as we read that she has been stunned into non-expression. Poor Anne. And then there's Mrs. Phillips. I do love Mrs. Phillips. Um, Mrs. Bennett's sister. We are told that she is a big talker. She talks a lot. She shouts. 
Uh, you may remember the, the scene where she flings open her window and shouts down to the street where her nieces and some officers are talking and she urges them to come up for a visit. Uh, she loves to gossip. She listens to gossip. She spreads gossip. When Mrs. Bennett is confined to her room during Lydia's disappearance, her sister, Mrs. Phillips, comes to visit and tells her all the bad news that she's heard about Mr. Wickham and his debts and his dalliances with the women in the town. But we never see any of her exact words in any of this, uh, possibly because she's really not saying anything very important. But finally, at the end of the book, near the end, she does get to say something. She finally has something important and useful to say. She is the one who tells Mrs. Bennett that Mr. Bingley is returning to Netherfield. So she is redeemed at last. She is allowed to join the land of the speaking, if only briefly. Now I'd like to uh, turn to one of my favorite subjects, uh, which is names, first names in particular in Pride and Prejudice and in Jane Austen in general. Um, again, other authors of the time, they loved the, to use romantic flowery names for their heroines. These were very fashionable at the time. Uh, just coming into what's, what's called the name stock, the, the pool of names that parents use for their children. Um, parents at this time, they didn't mess with boys' names very much. They, they continued to name their sons traditional English names. But for their daughters, they were willing to be a little more experimental. And many times they gave them these new fashionable names that were also used by um, many novelists, most novelists, uh, for their heroines. And you can see those names in the titles. Uh, you've got Pamela, Clarissa, Evelina, Cecilia, Camilla, Belinda, Laura, on and on. Um, I'm sure you've noticed most of these end in A. These A names were very popular at the time. And so, of course, Jane Austen did not like to use those. She preferred giving her characters traditional English names. But once in a while, she would give a female character a name ending in A. And when she did this, it was a signal to the reader that there was something about this person who isn't, that isn't quite trustworthy or reliable. Um, just, just look at the Bennett daughters. You've got Jane, Elizabeth, Mary, Catherine, all traditional English names, the names of Queens, and then there's Lydia. You gotta watch out for that one. Mariah Lucas, Charlotte's younger sister, another A name. Uh, and I do wanna pause here to say that Mariah is the correct pronunciation of this name at that time in that place. Um, I used to wonder about this, but I finally found the answer. Mariah um, was the pronunciation until after the Napoleonic Wars when the English started traveling more on the continent and they were exposed to the Maria pronunciation then. But at this time when Jane Austen is writing, it is Mariah. So Mariah Lucas, Charlotte's younger sister, is the one who goes with her to visit her sister um, at Hunsford Parsonage after Charlotte's marriage. She's a sweet girl, there's no harm in her, but she is very easily impressed, isn't she? Uh, remember that scene where she goes running to Elizabeth shouting, Lizzie, Lizzie, come to the window. There is such a sight to be seen. And Elizabeth goes rushing to the window and it's just Anne de Berg out there in her carriage talking to Mr. and Mrs. Collins. And Elizabeth is kind of like, oh, geez. Uh, but that's Mariah. 
And then of course there's Georgiana Darcy. Georgiana, another sweet girl, um, but very easily led, right? Naive and painfully shy. Our other, only other A name in Pride and Prejudice is Louisa Hurst, Mr. Bingley's married sister. Everything you need to know about Louisa is shown, I think, by looking at who she married. Mr. Hurst, I do love Mr. Hurst. Uh, he, we are told that he is someone who only looks the gentleman. He is a man of more fashion than fortune. And he is shocked, shocked that Elizabeth Bennet could prefer reading a book to playing cards. That's Mr. Hurst. I often wonder why Caroline doesn't have an A name. She seems like a really good candidate for it. Uh, but I'm sure Jane Austen had a reason. She had a reason for everything. Now, uh, the last thing I wanna talk to you about is Jane Austen's narrative technique. It was called a uh, free indirect discourse. Well, it wasn't called that then, it wasn't called anything. Now it's called free indirect discourse. This is something that other authors had played around with. There's a little bit of it here and there. So Jane Austen did not invent it, but she saw the possibilities in it. She developed it, she perfected it. She showed them how it was done. And it is now considered to be a revolutionary. One scholar, William Galperin, has pointed out that Austin's discovery of what free indirect discourse could do was comparable in the history of the novel to the discovery of the atomic bomb in the history of warfare. Thereafter, things were never the same and free indirect discourse became a basic feature of the novel. So let's talk about what that is. Uh, let me take you back for a minute to middle school, high school, some English teacher somewhere probably told you that an author can write a book from either the first person point of view where you say, I went to the store, the second person point of view, you went to the store or third person, he or she went to the store. The third person can be very, uh, have a variant of um, the third person omniscient where the narrator knows everything. They know, the narrator knows what the characters do, what they think, how they feel. Free indirect discourse is another variant on that. In free and direct discourse, the third person narrator will sometimes in the book sort of merge with a character. Uh, the boundary between the two gets very blurry and you are presented by the narrator with the character's thoughts. Let me show you some examples. We're gonna look at a couple of examples here. Let me share the screen, here we go. Here we go. Here's our, our first example is right after the Meriton assembly. And we are told Bingley had never met with pleasanter people or prettier girls in his life. Everybody had been most kind and attentive to him. There had been no formality, no stiffness. He had soon felt acquainted with all the room. And as to Miss Bennett, he could not conceive an angel more beautiful. This is Mr. Bingley, Oliver. This is his idiolect. Um, this is the way that he talks, the way that he thinks. This is not the narrator um, giving you some objective description of what Mr. Bingley thought about the ball. This is Mr. Bingley. Uh, the narrator is not telling you Mr. Bingley thought that. The narrator just presents you with his thoughts. Um, this is not a first person description where it says, where Mr. Bingley is saying, I never met pleasanter people, which sometimes happens in the uh, 
in the film versions, a lot of times the person doing the adapting will take this, uh, this passage and make it into dialogue, but it, it was not meant to be so. It's just his thoughts and we are just presented with them in Mr. Bingley's language, as he would say it with all his enthusiasm and his exaggerations, never met with pleasanter people or prettier girls in his life. And as to Miss Bennett, could not conceive of an angel more beautiful. Mr. Bingley, all over. In the second example, we have a contrast, Mr. Darcy. This is at Netherfield. Uh, when it is near the end of the time when Elizabeth and Jane are going to go back to Longbourn like the next day. Mr. Darcy has realized that he does have a strong attraction for Elizabeth Bennet, but he knows that this is an entirely improper uh, relationship. He has decided that he is going to cut that off. He's not going to think about her anymore. He, and he is going to let her know, if he can, um, that he, she should not expect anything from him. And we are told, he wisely resolved to be particularly careful that no sign of admiration should now escape him, nothing that could elevate her with the hope of influencing his felicity. Sensible that if such an idea had been suggested, his behavior during the last day must have material weight in confirming or crushing it. This is Mr. Darcy all over. This is his idiolect. It's so formal and so stiff. Nothing that could elevate her with the hope of influencing his felicity. Oh boy. Uh, so Mr. Darcy, that is our first clue that we are in free indirect discourse land here. Um, there are others with this. Um, this is a more complex free indirect discourse passage. The next one would be uh, the, the word now that is emphasized. No sign of admiration should now escape him. If this were just a straight narrator telling you all this, there would be no emphasis on a word. Uh, sometimes in free indirect discourse, you'll even see exclamation points or dashes or question marks, a narrator would never use those things and a narrator would not emphasize a word like this. And our third clue that we're here in free indirect discourse, I love it, it's absolutely delicious. The word wisely, he wisely resolved. Mr. Darcy thinks he's being wise. He thinks he is that he can control his attraction to Elizabeth. He thinks he's in no danger from her because he's decided to do this. He is, he is kidding himself, but he thinks he's being wise. Um, it's really a clever, subtle thing that Jane Austen has done with that one word. Uh, she might be poking a little fun at him for being so self-deluded a uh, very human thing to do. Um, I like it, especially because you might be drawn into this too. The first time you read this book, if you don't know how, it, how it's supposed to go, you might accept this from Mr. Darcy. You might think that this is the narrator telling you this and, and everything here is true and that's it for Mr. Darcy. And then when Mr. Wickham comes on this, the scene, you think, ah, He's the hero. He's the one who's going to marry Elizabeth Bennet. I know I did when I first read this book when I was a teenager. I thought it was going to be Mr. Wickham. But uh, when you reread this book, as you inevitably will, um, you might notice this wisely. And then you know, you know, you're in on the joke. He's, he's all wrong about himself. He's all wrong about his feelings. He's all wrong about what he thinks he can do with those feelings. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, this use of the word wisely, it is clever. It's subtle. It's sophisticated. It's revolutionary. It's genius. It is the genius of Jane Austen. 
Thank you very much for listening. I hope we have some more questions and comments. Yeah, I think we were holding on to one question from uh, Laura Bearfield again. Um, if she wants to, if she's still here with us. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question if you want to. Um, hi. hi. Um, so I was wondering, um, Sue, because you're talking about peculiarities of her style, I think probably the most well-known peculiarity of Jane Austen's writing is that she does not um, really dramatize proposal scenes. Mm -hmm. um, she only reports them extremely briefly. Um, and um, so I wonder what you might have to say about that. But I also find that so interesting that she doesn't report them because when you look at adaptations, particularly movies and things like that, um, it kind of gives people real leeway to create their own proposal scenes, which I thought has always been fine. But then in the last Emma movie last year, in the middle of it, she gets a bloody nose, which I thought was very strange. So anyway, I thought um, since your talk is peculiarities, if you wanted to um, address the proposal scene issue. Okay. Uh, I agree with you. That nosebleed. Ridiculous. Um, I read, although I read that that actually happened to the director. Yeah, it was an actual nosebleed and they kept it in. Oh, yeah. Oh, but um, I, I, I wouldn't have it. Anyway, but no, you're right. Um, she does not often or once in a while we'll see it in Emma. I think we get to see it. And of course, if you count that beautiful letter in Persuasion as a proposal, uh, then you see that too, the letter, what's usually called the letter, um, and which I love so much, uh, very romantic. But yes, uh, people are often frustrated by that lack of a proposal. We certainly see that in uh, Pride and Prejudice twice. <laughs> uh, but I think that maybe Jane Austen, I mean, we there's just speculation about why she did that. In Sense and Sensibility, you don't, you don't see it. Um, in um, Northanger Abbey, it's, it's, I don't think you, you get this, they don't, you don't really get the words. There's a lot left out there. Um, and I wonder if she is again, letting the reader decide what they think a romantic proposal scene would be and letting them, and they fill it in um there uh it is a really interesting thing and you mentioned the film versions i just heard a talk over the weekend from john mullen um author of my favorite book i love john mullen uh, and he was saying that every film version has to um has to have a kiss which people which uh, we readers complain about sometimes because it's not there in the book it's not in the book uh, but he says that they have to do this in order to create, make, to, in order to make clear that there's a chemistry there between these two, especially in Emma, when you're not thinking that way, but they have to sex it up a little and show you some, some of that, which you don't get in Jane Austen. Um, although there, I think you can feel the chemistry quite often in the books where maybe you do have to uh, make it more clear in the movies. But that's, that was just another interesting point on your question. But yeah, thank you for asking. Do you have, uh, Phil and Gabriel had a question. Oh, hi, Phil and Gabriel. Hi, um, this is actually Phil and Gabriel's mother. Um, oh. Hi, uh, there was, uh, what you spoke about the, um, the narrative voice, the, there were like indirect, sorry, there were lots of words. And the examples you gave made me think of um, that fabulous line from the end of the book. Happy was the day on which Mrs. Bennett got rid of her most deserving daughter. And it sort of, you know, given what you said, it sort of mixes Mrs. Bennett's narrative and the, and the narrator's sort of commentary mm. on Mrs. Bennett, like all in one sentence. That it, it's, yes, it's a, that's a, that's a masterful sentence, isn't it? It's wonderful. Uh, it tells you so much about, um, well, about the narrator's attitude towards Mrs. Bennett, I think, uh, and Mrs. Bennett herself. Oh, yes, finally she's happy. Um, but 
<laughs> but uh, but the way that it's phrased, it's just so so wonderful. It's it's uh, almost as wonderful as the first sentence of the book, really, which is justly famous. But that that sentence, you're right, should be famous as well. I think, yeah, love it. Thank you. If anyone Thanks wants for your to talk. Go. This is great. Oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for doing this for us. Um, it's a, it was an amazing talk. Um, anyone else want to unmute themselves and just go ahead and ask a question? We can have a discussion. Make an observation. Doesn't have to be a question. Yes, I just want to say thank you very much. It was enlightening. Oh, thank you, Dot. Thank you. I've, I've, I've read Pride and Prejudice probably, I don't know, 20 times. <laughs> and seen the movies, the movie, you know, all the versions over and over and over again. Yes. But um, didn't look at these or look for these finer points. And it's um, now I want to read the book again and to <laughs> pick out things, you know, pick out um, that free and direct discourse and um, uh, note, you know, um, pay more attention in detail. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Dot. I'm glad we um, inspired you to read for the 21st time. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about uh, contemporary novelists with Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, Walter Scott was an approximate contemporary, but his style is nothing like her and subject matter uh, is nothing like hers. Um, Dickens came later. I think that some of the novels like Pamela and Clarissa were earlier. Yes. Who were the, who were the people who were the uh, contemporaries publishing at the same time? And in what way would you compare and contrast them to Jane Austen? Oh, who could be compared to Jane Austen, really? Um, there, of the people who were publishing at that time, there are very few that are still being read today as Jane Austen is. Um, you mentioned Sir Walter Scott. Um, most people have heard of him. Uh, very few people have read his books still. Maybe in Scotland, they're still reading them. Uh, most people have heard of Ivanhoe. Um, few have read it. Uh, once in a while, they do a movie at the Rob Roy. Um, got that one back into print here. Um, but really, he's not read very much anymore. But he was contemporary with her. His first novel, Waverly, was published in 1814, which was the year after Pride and Prejudice. Uh, she complained to her sister that Sir Walter Scott should not be allowed to write novels. He was already making plenty of money as a poet. He should just stick with that and not take money out of the, or bread out of the mouths of other novelists. Um, other than him, let's see, there was Henry, Henry Fielding wrote Tom Jones earlier in, in he was in the 1700s, um, don't remember the exact year, after, Sir, after Samuel Richardson with Pamela, uh, which many people consider to be the first official novel, some will argue about that, but um, Pamela, uh, but we don't read him anymore, Samuel Richardson, we do read Tom Jones still. Um, once in a while, you might hear about Tristram Shandy. Uh, made a movie of it some decades ago uh, that maybe increased some interest, but it's a hard novel to read. Um, otherwise, really, unless you're a graduate student in English literature, I don't know that you're reading too many of her contemporaries. Mariah Edgeworth was certainly uh, one that Jane Austen admired, the book Belinda. Uh, Fanny Burney, Jane Austen admired Fanny Burney, Cecile, Cecilia and um, Camilla. Uh, but Jane Austen loved, her favorite book was Sir Charles Grandison by Samuel Richardson, which is well over a thousand pages long. I think it's over 1500 pages long. Uh, but she, according to her nephew, she read it multiple times uh, and really loved that book. But people don't read it today unless you're a big Jane Austen fan and you get curious and you want to know, uh, you want to read her favorite book. And uh, so you try, you try. But um, I will say one more thing about Sir Walter Scott. 
it, which was that his influence was incredible. He was, the Waverly was an incredible bestseller, incredible. Um, <coughs> most of us haven't even heard of it anymore, um, much less read it, but he was incredibly influential. He's credited with inventing the historical fiction genre, but, uh, but he did not. Uh, Waverly was not the first historical fiction novel, but he's the one who popularized it. He made it allowable for men to write novels because his novels were so manly. And until then, they, they were mostly written by women with women as the main characters. They were mostly read by women. Men did read them, but often wouldn't admit that they read them. Sir Walter Scott made it okay for men to read novels and to write them. And of course, once men started reading and writing novels, novels gained in respectability, wouldn't you know it. But okay, uh, at least it happened. Uh, so Sir Walter Scott, uh, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I think um, Laura, mm -hmm. uh, Laura Bearfield also suggests, is, is Elizabeth Gaskell later? Yeah. She's later, yes. Yeah. Yes, um, 1848, North and South, maybe. I know I've looked that up. I know I've thought about that and I looked it up and she was later. Wives and daughters. Yes, wives and daughters, North and South. I love North yeah. and South. And I don't, if I can interject, um, I mean, you're talking about 18th century novels as um, the realm of graduate students and very long books and things like that. Um, and I might just suggest that, you know, if people really love the love Austin and are interested in the stuff of this period, you know, even if a novel is long, like um, Tom Jones is an amazing oh. novel. And so, you know, you can read 300 pages of it and then go read something else and then come back and read another 300 pages, um, you know, that you can break this stuff up and, you know, really enjoy reading um, these, these rather long things, but there are also shorter ones. Um, Fielding writes a novel called Joseph Andrews, um, which is, I'm trying to remember, it's probably not more than 300 pages. Um, so, you know, um, I, I wouldn't, um, be discouraged um, if you're if you're interested in reading beyond Austin. Oh, oh, yeah. I sorry. As a as a retired librarian, I would never discourage people from reading um, anything. But it will be hard to find some of those others. Uh, you may have to buy it or get it on interlibrary loan because so few people are reading them now. But Tom Jones, oh, that is a rollicking good time. Uh, my my book club read that a few years ago, and it was very popular. Uh, I think, Sue, you're talking more about like Sir Charles Grandison is seven volumes. That's a commitment. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. But your book club read the first 50 to 100 pages, I think. That was right. And, and I wanted to continue. No one else did except for Lori. There was one other person in the group willing to go on to volume two. Everybody else was like, that's enough. We got we got a <laughs> feel for it. That's good. We're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I uh, we have a Jane Austen book club that's reading Evelina by Frances Burney or Fanny Burney, whichever you choose. Uh, right now, I, I suspect there won't be a lot of people finishing that one either, but, but we're trying it. We're gonna give it a try and uh, get an idea of it at least, yeah. And then Giselle also um, suggested Maria Edgeworth and Charlotte Smith, but we might be just retreading the theme. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you, Giselle. I'm not familiar with Charlotte Smith. I'll have to look that one up. Okay. And then um, also Anne Radcliffe. Mm -hmm. And then Laura agreed with Radcliffe. Um, just looking for questions, but Joseph Andrews is also a short novel by Fielding. Um, and what was Jane's favorite book again? Sir Charles Grandison. Mm -hmm. the, the hero's name is the name of the book. Sir Charles Grandison, G-R-A-N-D-I-S-O-N. Mm -hmm. by Richardson, uh, the same person who wrote Pamela, okay. most well-known novel. Mm -hmm. If you want a challenge. <laughs> I think, and I the, think the satire Shamala, was that? Um, be Fielding. Yeah, Fielding wrote Shamala. <laughs> yeah, satire of Pamela, yes. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's all the questions that I have in the chat. If anyone wants to chime in and ask a question, we have maybe like another time for one more. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> no, everyone's had their fill. Oh, that's great. I mean, we timed it really well. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Sue, for a wonderful presentation. You did a really excellent job. Um, and it's uh, very encouraging going forward as we try to develop a series of these kinds of programs. Um, we're getting a lot of thanks in the chat. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing the way that you found out about this program. I will certainly keep you informed of upcoming programs similar to this one. And I will be sending a copy of the recording out to anyone who is registered as well. Um, so thank you. Please let me know if you have any questions. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Sue. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chelmsford Public Library for- and Thank you, Deanna. Allowing me to do this, I feel lucky. Thank you all so much uh, for coming and staying till the end. Thank you. Once again, if you haven't already joined our group on Goodreads, definitely check that out. Uh, the classics, Chelmsford Classics book group um, on Goodreads. We're going to be starting Fahrenheit 451. Uh, if you'd like to revisit that novel or read it for the first time. And good night, everyone. <laughs> good night. Thank, Thank you very much.